everyone, I'm Luke Kennedy and I'm joining you for English, Maths, Science and plenty of other interesting learnings today. Coming up in English, we'll learn about the importance of procedural text. In Maths, we'll explore the skeletons within three-dimensional shapes and in Science, we'll all become botanists looking at the stages in the life of plants. Are you ready? Let's get started. When you're presented with a recipe, it's important to follow the instructions in the right order so that you end up with a lovely meal. If you're given directions, it's important to follow them correctly so that you don't get lost. So let's see how to follow a written procedure to make sure we achieve the outcome that we want. It would be good to have a pencil, an eraser and a piece of paper for this lesson. Hello. Today I've been thinking about times when I've tried to make something and it just didn't work out. Either I didn't follow the instructions correctly or the instructions weren't very clear. Has this ever happened to you? Today we're going to look at how important it is for instructions to be written clearly in procedural texts. But first, do you remember what a procedural text is? That's right. A procedural text is an informative text that gives directions or instructions to help us do, use or make something. Let's look at an example you might have seen before. It's a procedure for making a warthog puppet. Let's see if we can recognise some of the features of a written procedure. So, a procedural text has a goal, which is usually included in the title. It has a list of materials or equipment we will need to make the puppet. There is also a list of instructions that tell us the steps to make the puppet in the right order. This is called the method. There are some more clues in the method that help us recognise this is a procedural text. What do you notice about the types of sentences used to give instructions? That's right. They are all command sentences telling us what to do. For example, squeeze the paint or use sticky tape. Each command statement is written in formal language and begins with a verb in the present tense. So what happens if the instructions aren't in the right order? Let's take a look. In this example, we're now starting with step four as the first step. Slowly take your hand off the cardboard and use your finger to paint any gaps. But if this is our first instruction, where is the paint? We don't have any yet because we were supposed to squeeze it onto the plastic lids first. If a procedure is not in the right sequence, then it most likely will not succeed. Let's have a go at another procedure called how to draw a frog. That sounds like fun. So what materials does it say I need to draw it? The materials say writing materials and paper. Well, that's easy. Do you have some writing materials and paper at home? Why don't you get them and you can have a go at drawing too. I'm going to ask my friend Jo to read me the instructions. Hi Pascal. Hi Jo, how are you going? Very well, thank you. I'm happy to help. Thank you. Are you ready? Yes. Okay then, here we go. Draw a circle. Then three round circles. Rub away the lines behind the eyes. Rub away what? Shade the bit in the middle of each circle. Next, draw small dots. Draw a big mouth with a tongue and shade the rest. Add things on the top of the eyes. What? Add a rectangle as well. Well, oh my goodness, this looks terrible, Jo. This is terrible. How did you go with your drawing? Well, what went wrong? I think the instructions weren't very clear, Pascal. Mm, I agree. They need to be more specific, don't they? Let's see if we can fix it. So the main thing I notice is that the nouns and the adjectives, which are the words that describe the nouns, are not clear enough. 
For starters, instead of writing materials, you're going to need a pencil and an eraser because they tell you to rub things out. I think we could improve these instructions by making sure that the nouns and the adjectives are the right words. We can also think of prepositional phrases like above the two circles or in the middle of the page to help us to know where on the page where we should be drawing. So for example, instead of draw a circle, it's actually more like an oval on its side, isn't it? And we need to say that it should be a large oval and that it should start in the middle of the page. How does this step look now? Much better. I think it also helps to have pictures too, don't you? Oh, that's a great idea, Jo. OK, let's go. Great. Draw a large oval on its side in the middle of the page. Draw a rainbow-shaped curve inside the oval for the nose and a circle at each edge of the nose for the round eyes. Rub away the lines of the face that cross behind the eyes. Shade two dark ovals on the inside of the eyes and draw two small dots to make the eyes sparkle. Draw a big smile. Start with a shallow curve at the top and another lower, deeper curve at the bottom to make the mouth wide. Add a bump for the tongue and shade in the rest. Add eyelids next by drawing a curved line towards the top of each eye. Add two lines beneath the head of the side of the body and for the arms as well. Shade a small box under the chin for the head's shadow. There we have it, a much better drawing of a frog. Oh, it's so much better. How did you go with your drawing that time? Did the improvements to the procedure help you? Oh, thanks, Jo, for reading out those instructions for us. No worries, Pascal. That's a great drawing of a frog. I'm glad I could help. You can see how important it is to follow a procedure in order and that the method is written as clearly as possible so that we can be successful at following the instructions. Do you know how to draw an animal? Perhaps you would like to create a procedure for drawing your favourite animal, a dog or a cat or maybe even a panda. Make sure you think carefully about the order of the instructions and challenge a family member to see if they can follow them. Have some fun with it. Well, that's all for today. Thanks for helping out, Jo. That's OK, Pascal. Anytime. See you next time. See you, everybody. I hope that everyone out there has been looking after themselves lately, taking care to wash their hands and adopt healthy habits. Here's a couple of people with some suggestions that you might find useful. Hi, I'm Lauren. Hi, I'm Arthur and I'm in grade two. Today we're going to talk about how we can be healthy. Arthur, can you tell me different ways to be healthy? Brush your teeth, drink lots of water, keep active and eat healthy fruits and vegetables. Fruits and vegetables, that's great ideas. Can you tell me what are your favourite fruits and vegetables? Mangoes and apples and cucumber and carrot. Wow, that's great variety. If you had to choose a healthy snack, what would it be? Some biscuits, cucumber and apple. Wow, are they great snacks. Now, why is it so important for us to eat these healthy fruits and vegetables? So we don't get sick and we don't lose any teeth. What else does it do for our bones and muscles and heart? It keeps them strong and healthy. That is correct. So it's so important for us to eat healthy fruits and vegetables. Thanks for joining us today, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. I'm just feeling the bones in my arm that give it its structure. There's bones in my forearm, 
I have a joint at my wrist and there's another joint at my elbow. And of course, there's an entire skeleton that gives my body its shape. In mathematics today, Teresa is going to be talking not about a human skeleton, but about skeletal models of three-dimensional shapes. Hi again, I'm Teresa. Do you like my cool new lampshade? It's a 3D geometric object, but the faces are missing. The edges are represented by these rods, and the vertices are the corners where two or more rods are joined together. It would be really pretty if the faces were made from coloured glass. The light would make coloured patterns on the wall. This type of geometric shape is called a skeletal model because it shows a 3D object using only the edges and corners that give it structure, like a skeleton. We're going to make skeletal models of some familiar 3D objects today using straws and plasticine balls. Let's remind ourselves what a 3D object is. 3D stands for three-dimensional. A three-dimensional object has three dimensions length, width and height. Let's make the skeletal model of this 3D object. Do you remember its name? It has 12 edges, 8 vertices and all of its faces are squares. It's a cube. To make the skeleton or skeletal model of this cube, we'll need 12 straws for each of the edges and eight plasticine balls for the vertices. So first we make two squares by sticking the straws into the plasticine balls. So I chose pink ones for these. Good fun choosing colours. And because it's a square, it has four sides and four vertices. And we know that all the sides of a square are equal. So we're gonna make two squares that are exactly the same. So that's the bottom face of my cube. Then I take four more straws and four more plasticine balls to make another square exactly the same. So I'm sticking in there, all joining up nicely. And so we've got three corners done, nearly there. We'll have two identical squares. There we go. Close to identical. There we are. Then we add four upright squares to the vertices at the face of the bottom. So we uprights here. Four uprights. One, two, three, and four. All right. And then we're going to connect the faces to complete our cube. All right, this is the delicate bit. So we pop that on top and we carefully join them up. And there we have it. So our skeletal model of a cube has six square faces, even though they're see-through, and 12 edges and eight vertices, which are pink. So knowing the edges and vertices of a, an object helps us to create 3D skeletal models. All right, so I'll pop that one aside. Do you remember what a rectangular prism looks like? Here's one. What would the skeleton look like? Well, it has 12 edges, and it still has eight vertices, like the cube, but the faces are rectangles instead of squares. So let's make one. So this time we're going to start with two rectangle shapes. So I need my four straws again, but we've got two long and two short for each rectangle. So I've got blue plasticine balls this time. We join them up, so we're going to have four vertices at the bottom, four at the top. So we're making two identical rectangles this time. So that some things equal and some things are not. All right, here's our second rectangle. 
So much fun to do maths with Play-Doh. All right, here we go. Ooh. All right, so now I've got two rectangles. Okay, to complete this rectangular prism, we're going to add four upright edges to the face of the bottom, the vertices of the face at the bottom, and connect the top face. So we'll put in our uprights again. One, two, three, and four. All right, and now we're going to complete our rectangular prism by putting this other rectangular face up on top and connecting it very carefully. So they wiggle around a little bit. And there we are. Okay, so here's the skeletal model of our rectangular prism. All right, so I'll pop that one aside. All right. Here's our last object. It has four triangle faces, one square face, eight edges and five vertices or corners. Do you remember what it is? It's a type of pyramid. Let's construct its skeletal model. So this time I need eight straws for the edges and five plasticine balls for the vertices. So this time I need to make one square for the base. I'll use my yellow. So we put our four sides together to make one square. So we're back to four equal sides again because we're talking about a square. And then when we've done that, it's going to look a little bit different because you'll see some diagonals this time. So then I put the final four straws in the vertices, but they're all going to lean in towards the centre to meet at a point to form the final vertex of the pyramid. So I've got them there, they're slanting in to reach up and join them up together. And I'm going to make the final vertex. back there. Here we go. Okay, there we are. There's the top. We'll just fix that bit at the bottom. All right, there we go. So my pyramid is now represented as a skeletal model. So today we've learned how to make skeletal models of 3D objects. Once you've mastered making prisms, you might like to search for or experiment with some other geometric shapes to make. They make lovely hanging decorations. Some of them even look like diamonds and only require some straws and string. And if you make them from plastic or wood, you can hang them outside to watch them swing in the breeze. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. Making hanging decorations that will sway outside in the breeze, I think that sounds like a lovely project for this afternoon. But right now we're going to share some information that might help you with your reading. Hello. Have you read any new books lately? I'll give you some tips that might help whenever you are about to read a book or a text for the first time. Good readers use what they already know about a topic to help them when they are reading. This is called activating prior knowledge or remembering what you already know about a topic. Do you know how to activate your prior knowledge? An easy way is to look at the front and the back cover of a book or to look over the text and then ask yourself some questions based on what you see. You might ask yourself, what do I think this book or text is about? What do I already know about this topic? You can also use your five senses to help you activate your prior knowledge. I'm going to use my hand to help me. Five senses, five fingers. Are you ready? Let's do it together. When you think about a topic of your book, you can ask yourself, hmm, 
What do I see? What do I hear? What do I feel? What can I smell? What can I taste? Try asking yourself these questions to activate your prior knowledge next time you find a new book or a text to read. Do you enjoy getting your hands dirty digging in the garden? Maybe you recycle your food scraps by digging them into the soil. Or perhaps you plant seeds, water them and watch them grow. Today in science, we're going to explore the different parts of a plant and the stages in their life cycle. Hi, I'm Angie. Different places around the world have plants that are unique to that area. They have grown to be well suited to the conditions and we say they are native plants. In Australia, we have an abundance of native plants too. In fact, most of our modern plants originated when Australia was part of the supercontinent Gondwana during this Cretaceous period. That was 66 to 145 million years ago. There are over 24,000 different types of species of plants in Australia, from trees like wattle and eucalyptus trees to wildflowers like banksias, as well as grasses. Indigenous Australians have relied on and used plants for thousands of years to live healthy, sustainable lives. Plants are used for food, medicine, shelter and tools. For example, Aboriginal peoples have a detailed knowledge of hundreds of plants, including where and when they grow, how to encourage their growth, and when and how to gather them. They also used fire as a land management tool to help plants thrive and produce plenty of bush food and medicine. Today we are going to work like botanists and explore the life cycle of plants. Let's start by exploring the features of plants. Scientists use the term structures to describe the features of plants. Here we can see that plants have roots, a stem and leaves. Some plants also have flowers and some have cones. Each part of the plant has an important role to help it survive and reproduce. The roots of plants are located below the soil. They help to anchor the plant and absorb water and nutrients from the soil to grow. Here are some roots that you can eat. The stem of plants is located above the ground and it helps the plant to stand upright and supports the leaves. It also carries water and nutrients collected by the roots to the leaves where they are used to help the plant to grow. Here are some stems that we can eat. So how do plants transport water and nutrients from the soil up to leaves? Take a look at these two cabbage leaves. This one has been placed with, in water with some blue food colouring. Notice how the leaves have turned blue compared to this one. That's because it's used its channels to move the water from the bottom to the top. Now these leaves on the plant are found on branches on the stem. They use the sunlight and air as well as the water and nutrients collected by the roots to help the plant to grow. You will notice that the leaves of plants are green. This is because they contain a chemical that is green. This chemical helps the plant to absorb the sun's light to make food to grow. Here are some leaves you can eat. Flowers can also have an important role in a plant's life cycle. They are the reproductive parts of plants. They come in different colours, shapes and sizes and this helps to attract animals like birds and insects to help move the pollen from one flower to another. This is a process called pollination. Here are some flowers we can eat. 
After pollination, flowers develop into seeds and fruit. I'm sure you all know some fruits we can eat. Okay, now that we know the structures of a plant, let's explore its life cycle. Here we have different stages of a bean plant. The life cycle starts as a seed, which is normally found under the soil. In the soil, the seed germinates or starts to grow roots, a stem and some small leaves. As the plant grows and matures, it will flower and the flowers will develop into fruits with seed. When the fruit falls from a tree or is carried by animals or the wind to a new location, a new seed might begin to grow. We can represent these stages scientifically in a diagram. Here is the life cycle of a plant, showing the seed, seedling, immature tree and mature tree, which has flowers. Seed pods develop from flowers and these seeds can grow into new plants. Now all plants grow through similar stages in their life cycle, but they aren't all the same. For example, grasses have flowers, but they don't have fruit. And some plants don't have flowers or fruit. For example, pine trees have seeds in cones and ferns don't have seeds or flowers or fruit. They have spores. Maybe you might like to explore this another time. Okay, let's recap what we've learnt today. We now know that plants have parts that help to survive, including roots, stems and leaves. The life cycle of a plant describes its growth from a seed to a mature plant that flowers. And some plants reproduce using flowers, whilst others use cones or spores. Now it's your turn. You might like to plant your own bean seeds to eat and observe the changes in their life cycle. You might like to sketch and measure it as it grows. Or perhaps you could see how many different parts of a plant you can eat in a week. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Thank you for joining me for Learning at Home TV today. I'm heading off now, but I have a brain break for you first. Then Victoria will be here to join our upper primary students for their lessons. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Jane. Hi, I'm Kaylin. I'm in grade five. Kaylin, what's your favourite physical activity or sport and why? Well, my favourite physical sport is soccer. I like it because it's a good experience, it's a team effort and you're just having fun. That's great reasoning. I think we can do some soccer moves right here, right now, yep. including in a safe space at home. Yep. Our first move is going to be... Happy feet. Happy feet. Right, oh. Shifting the ball as if we had one between our feet. Three, two, one, and stop. Our second move can be... High knee march. As if we're volleying a ball on top of our knees. Takes a bit of control, this skill. Try it with the ball outside later. And our third move is going to be... Kicking at a goal. So using one step back and then kicking. Right -o, one step back and kick. And then you can use your other foot as long as you like. Step back and kick. Step back and kick. That's all for now. Moving more matters, so move when you can and get back to learning for now. Bye.